part three of the lecture. We are looking at a very important algorithm today named as gradient boosting. So let's see what we have in menu today. So we'll start by looking at its difference with Adaboost. If you do not remember about Adaboost, I request you to go through our previous lecture. Next, we'll see how gradient boost can be applied for regression. Why regression? Because that is the most easy to understand from context of gradient boosting. Then we'll see how this can be roughly extended for classification. Finally, please understand that boostings are complex models, has lot of parameters. So they will have a tendency to feed the data more, tendency to overfeed. That's the reason a discussion on regularization is must. So let's start with an introduction to Adaboost. So if you remember, Adaboost builds stumps. Stumps are very simple trees which has just one decision node and then leaf nodes. And there, every observation gets different weights. So earlier, whatever algorithm we have studied, every observation, every row has equal weight. But in Adaboost, while the first decision stump gets trained, all observations have equal weight. However, if some observations are getting misclassified, let's say row 2 and row 4 are getting misclassified, in the next stage, in the next term, the weight of these observations will be increased and all other weights will be readjusted so that the overall weight is still 1. And the trees also have different voting power. What is the meaning of that? That means that in the final prediction, every tree has different say and the say is proportional to its accurate classification capability. Okay, so our stamps will last just look like this and this picture also tells you that these models are built sequentially. So it takes the data, looks at the errors, on the basis of that error, next model is built and that's how it proceeds. However, Gradient boost builds fully grown trees, no longer stumps, and it doesn't increase the weight or increase the misclassification cost. However, it tries to fit residual of the previous tree. We will see how that works in a minute. And please note, gradient boosting is one of the front runner models in data science competitions. However, it is a very black box model and is difficult to understand. In this lecture, we will try our best to unpack the model step by step for you. Let's get started with the regression. In this data set, we have considered x1 and x2 are the independent variable. Using that, we are going to predict y, right? So this is a regression problem. And you are going to build trees sequentially, right? So what the first tree will be? Let's see that. The first tree will have just one leaf. What is the meaning of one leaf? The meaning of one leaf is for all the seven observations, it will predict only one value. What will be the property of such value? The property of such value will be that it should minimize the residuals. Do you remember what is residuals? So if these red circles represent the actual values, by regression, what you try to do is you try to fit a line. What is the property of the line? The line should minimize the residuals. And what is the residual? Residual is nothing but the actual minus predicted, observed minus predicted. So for this observation, this perpendicular is your residual. Okay. So if we take this one value, what will be that value which minimizes the residual? It will simply be the average of the seven values. If I do a quick calculation, add this all up, we'll get a value of 70. If I take an average, it will come to 10. Let's calculate the residuals now. So it will be 12 minus 10 equal to 2, 15 minus 10 equal to 5. Like that way, coming all the way down, we get 9 minus 10 equal to minus 1. Okay, so what do I do with these residuals? These residuals will be the target variable for the next decision tree. This is the most critical part. 
that for the next decision tree, this residual is going to be the target variable. Okay. So the residual is nothing but y minus y1 hat. y1 hat is the predicted y value from the first decision tree, which is 10 over here. Okay. And then for the third tree, the residual will be calculated as y minus y1 hat plus y2 hat. Okay. This way it will go. However, if we try to fit the residual completely, it may give overfitting. That's why we will resort to learning rate, which we have used in many machine learning algorithm. Instead of directly using y2 bar, we can use alpha to scale it down to some extent. Okay. And then this was the third tree. What about the fourth tree? Fourth tree will calculate residual like y minus y1 hat plus alpha into y2 hat plus alpha into y3 hat. All right. Let's look at the example in more detail now. So these residuals we have already calculated. These are target variable of the decision tree. Let's assume that the decision tree is built now. Here, if you look at this, there are one decision node here, second decision node here, and three leaf nodes. What is the meaning of this? That there is a condition based on x1 and x2, x1 and x2's value. Here also there is a uh, condition based on x1 or x2's value. This has been abstracted at, as it has nothing to do with understanding how gradient boosting works. However, if you follow the decision nodes, you will land up in leaf one for observation three and six. If you follow the decision nodes, you will land up in leaf two for observation one, four, five, and seven. And finally, if you follow this path, you will land up in leaf three, which has observation two. Okay. So let's see what will be the prediction in this decision tree if some unknown node is there and it follows this decision path. Okay, so as there are two nodes here, then the most simple thing will be to calculate the average. Okay, so let's say the third observation, it has residual of minus 5. The sixth observation has residual of minus 3. So any node or any observation will follow this path. We will say it will be average of minus 5 and minus 3, which is nothing but minus 4. Similarly, we can calculate for 1, 4, 5, and 7, which comes to be 0 0.75. And for leaf 3, which has only one observation, 2, or the second observation, for that, the residual is 5. Okay? So that's how the this tree's prediction is going to be. Now, how we can calculate the predicted value using the first decision tree and the second decision tree? What we do is we show the observation only for the first three observations, okay? And for each one of them, we start with the prediction that the first decision tree makes. So all of them starts with 10. For the second one, for the second component, we use a learning rate of 0 0.2. And for the first observation, if you follow this decision path, this comes to this leap to, it, it predicts the value to be 0 0.75. So it will be 10 plus 0 0.2 into 0 0.75, which is 10.15. Let's check out the second observation. Second observation means it will come here. It predicts the value of 5. So I will do 10 plus 0 0.2 into 5 equal to 11. Now let's look at the third observation, which is 10 plus 0 0.2 into minus 4. Third observation is here. So here I will get 9.2. And the residual here will be 5 minus 9.2 or minus 4.2. So this is the residual of the second decision tree. This will act as the target variable for the third decision tree. Okay. So we have just written the residuals for all of the observations over here. If you look closely, there is a pattern emerging for each of the observations, the residuals are going down. So together, the decision trees are making better and more accurate prediction. Let's just extend this calculation little bit further. Okay, 
So let's assume the decision tree will still have the same structure with two decision nodes and three leaf nodes. Okay. Let's just look at one example further. Here, if we come to leaf one, now for third observation, it is minus 4.2 and the sixth observation it is minus 2.2. So the average is minus 3.2 here. It has reduced from minus 4. Now for the third observation, for the third tree, if we are predicting, it will have three components. The first component comes from the first tree, which has just one leaf, 10. From the second tree, we are getting 0 0.2 into minus 4. And for the third tree, we are getting 0 0.2. Learning rate is still 0 0.2 and the prediction is minus 3.2. So the summation is 8.56. Residual is 5 minus 8.56 or minus 3.56. So gradually it is going down. Okay. So that is how, you know, the different trees added sequentially will bring down the residual. One important question, how long we will work like this? So you can have a predetermined number of trees or you can see where your loss rate or where this residual is not changing much. So there you can take a decision and stop. All right. Now let's look at this is the boosting part. What it has to do with gradient. If you remember, if we use linear regression, we deal with residuals. And from gradient descent, we know that the loss function is observed minus predicted square. Okay, so this is the loss function. And what do we want to find out? We, wa we want to minimize this value using the gradient of the function with respect to predicted. Okay, and the loss function can be trivially multiplied by half. So if some values of predicted minimizes L, half the same value of predicted will of course minimize half of L. So without any change in the formulation, we can take L equal to half into sigma i observed i minus predicted i square. So very quickly, you will understand what was the need of this juggling. If a derivative is taken, this turns out to be, you know, when we do a del L del predicted, this two comes here, and this becomes observed minus predicted into minus 1 or it is minus observed i minus predicted i which is for one observation. So the residual is nothing but the negative of the gradient. Hence this name gradient boosting comes. So from now on when we refer that we are trying to fit the residual of the previous tree, we no longer will say that we will try to fit the residual but we are trying to fit the gradient, okay? So often instead of residual, the term pseudo residual is used. Why so? The reason is that you can use different loss function instead of this one. And when you take a gradient, when you take a derivative, that may not be directly the residual, okay? So that's where the pseudo residual term comes from. When we say that, let's look at another loss function. So let's say these are your yi actual values and this is your fxi which you have predicted. What is the loss function? Loss function is yi minus f square by 2. So when we calculate this, these are the values that we get. Any observations that you have? If you see that for any one where there is an outlier, like this one is an outlier, this model pays too much attention to outliers. You see what is the you know, residual that is coming from this. Try hard to incorporate the outliers into the model. That degrades the overall performance. Are there any other loss function? Let's discuss just one of them. One of them is called as Huber loss, which is a function of y and f. When it is less than is a value delta, then you have the same loss function. However, if it is more than delta, then you scale down the value. Okay, so let's see how your loss calculation changes now. So if you use the square loss now, this is how it comes to be. And if you use Huber loss with a delta of 0 0.5, you get values like 0 0.05, 0 0.02. There is no change here because if you remember, if it is less than delta, there is no change. However, if it, has a, if it is an outlier, 
the value is quite 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 scaled down okay so that allows us to build a much better model essentially why we discuss this loss function to tell you that instead of the squared error you can have a different uh, different loss function that different loss function can have a different gradient which is different from residual that's why we call it gradient boosting not residual boosting okay so this is the algorithmic format don't worry too much about it we will try to whatever we have discussed we'll try to just map with that so let's say we have a training set with xi and yi and a differentiable loss function as you are taking a derivative you need a loss function which is differentiable and number of iterations m means that actually you are building capital m trees okay so in, you initialize your model with a constant value all right and what is this constant value this constant value so this equation just gives you the average value all right and then what you do is you compute the so called pseudo residual you remember for each one of the observations we were calculating the residuals and as you can have different pseudo value okay so or different loss function you call it a pseudo residual and as usual you are taking the derivative negative of the gradient you see okay now you feed a base learner so this becomes your target now like the way we saw in our uh, data set so this is what is your uh, training set now and now you are doing some math to find the gamma okay so what is this gamma actually so gamma is as i said that when there are multiple nodes following in the same leaf node right in this case okay so there are multiple nodes we are following in the same leaf node what is happening we are taking an average right so instead of average we can have some different function which better minimizes the loss so for that you can use a parameter like lambda okay and gradually if you see what is happening is you are uh, you are trying to find out this lambda which minimizes this loss function and for each layer you are building the model so in the last layer your model was fm minus 1x now you are getting as you remember a model is always represented by the hypothesis so by hmx and uh, you are you have already found the parameter so you multiply that and this is the model that you have so after m steps it will have m terms from each one of the decision trees okay if you do not understand this completely do not worry about it i have understood or, or told you the concept and now if you try to map it roughly this should make some sense to you okay now let's come to classification here this is more complex than regression however this can be again treated as a regression problem following the concept of logistic regression do you remember that what we were regressing in logistic tree and what we are going to regress here so instead of regressing one tree as in regression tree we regress k trees one for each class if there are k classes what we do or do over here we build k regression models for that and for each regression or each tree what we are regressing we are regressing the log odds if you remember right probability of x where x equal to where x means y equal to 1 given the value of x it was given as e, e to the power beta 0 plus beta 1 x which follows the logistic function and log of px by 1 minus px this is the term which is called as odd follows a perfectly regression line so this is the term we are going to regress now and all things will be similar okay so we start with initial models fa fb fc fz so if you remember for regression we started with on, only one uh, model here we are trying with so many models and this example is where you have a handwritten character okay and you are trying to find out whether it is a b c or z and you iterate until converge so you find the negative gradients gradient for each of the classes okay fit a regression tree for the negative negative gradients okay which are called as ha hb hz 
then you use a parameter rho a which is similar or can be used equivalently like gamma and you update the model. So it is similar manner only thing is that instead of one model to start with you are starting with n models where your number of models is equal to the number of classes. Also the loss function is different here we are no longer trying to minimize the squared loss here we are focusing on the logistic regression values okay all right so here if we if you uh, uh, look at one example as i said that in the problem we are trying to find out uh, trying to find out the probability of each of the classes so he, here you have 26 uh, classifiers for alphabets a to z okay and this is the true probability value that means that actually this was a g okay so this is the true probability distribution when you start your model every tree is similar so it may be something like this where all of them has equal probabilities after certain iterations okay based on the shape maybe g q r starts to emerge starts to take higher values right so it is in way trying to tell you that we you, you are going closer to the actual probability distribution true probability distribution maybe after 100 iterations you will see that you have the probability of g has been the highest okay so that's how it tries to tries to step by step to come at the probability distribution and here the loss function is actually the difference between this true probability distribution and this predicted probability distribution what you want is this predicted probability distribution to be as close as this distribution there are several ways to find the difference between or use a loss function which compares two probability distributions now coming to the regularization part as i said this is a complex model and it will have a tendency to overfit so the first is shrinkage and this is a parameter that has been used for the shrinkage so this is nothing but your learning rate which will be between 0 and 1 so there are several notations that are being used and i have tried to use all of them so you can identify them when you see different notations next parameter is depth okay so what is the role of depth more the depth more the tree tries to overfit the depth so if you keep a predefined value of depth it will regularize the tree number of observations in leaf okay number of observations if you keep small again it will follow outliers or it will try to fit each one of the observations so this is also one of the controlling factors number of trees as you increase number of trees more will be the overfitting complexity of the tree complexity of the tree is a function of you know how many nodes are there how many levels are there how many things you are allowing in the leaf nodes so essentially again less complex the tree less it is prone to overfitting finally you can use stochastic gradient boosting which means instead of running the gradient boosting on the entire data set you can take sub samples you can take subset of the data set and can run boosting on it okay so we try to discuss gradient boosting in this lecture hope you have understood it any questions please give at the comments and we'll be very happy to go through all of them and answer thank you so much for watching this video